is um, um, I, so like we were we were drinking last night at uh, you know like some bar dvorishtance and then I was introducing Sophie to some people and uh, I just said like this is Sophie she's awesome uh, so that's that's really all I have to say like Sophie is someone that uh, that joined our team uh, like a year and a maybe in December 20. 14, I don't remember what year it is. Uh, so we were, you know, we did Hackaday Prize for the first year. It was, it was a awesome experience, but you know, a lot of us were like very deeply involved and you know, we have a lot of other things to take care of. So we, so we said, okay, we need to hire someone that's gonna really drive this. But we, it, it was really hard to, uh, it was really hard to uh, come up with, uh, with the job description because it's someone that's an engineer and you know, can talk with people and very creative and all these things, and it's like a, so we said, oh, it's kind of like a unicorn. So we, we put out an article on Hackaday uh, as, you know, searching for a, for a unicorn. And then, uh, and then somehow, you know, Sophie showed up, and she's really, you know, transformed. So a lot of what we, um, you know, as, as I kind of mentioned, you know, we have been trying to evolve the Hackaday editorial and the Hackaday culture to just go from beyond pure entertainment to what Brian Benchoff calls a, a grad school for hackers. So just really trying to come up with a content that like elevates the, you know, the discussion uh, and it's, you know, it's not just how to blink an LED and then, you know, and then, and then you know, I'm a maker. Uh, but, you know, rather, you know, how do we build, you know, the kind of things that people do in grad school, you know, solving hard problems. And another, another piece that's, that's really interesting for me is, uh, is really the art side of things. Because, you know, in a lot of cases, there are only so many engineering applications, but when you explode to the world of, of, the world of art, you know, there are, so many, there are so many exciting opportunities for creation. And if you guys are around uh, in a city uh, for next week, there's an amazing uh, festival here in Belgrade called Resonate that's all about, you know, digital art and things like that. Uh, but anyway, so Sophie is someone that really combines both of these worlds. So she's at the same time, you know, an amazing accomplished artist as well as a real hardcore uh, professional hardware engineer. And, and so she really brought up a whole unique uh, point of view uh, to, our, to our community and just me personally, I you know, couldn't be happier working with her. So give it up a round of applause for Sophie Kravitz. Thanks. Hi, I'm Sophie. That was a nice introduction, Alec. This talk has a really long name because I had to come up with the name of a talk about two months ago. So I just kind of made something up based on what I was working on at the time. So we're just gonna skip to the next slide. Hi. <laughs> this is my first time being in this part of the world. I love traveling, I've been all over the place. And when I came on to Supply Frame, like was said in the first presentation, I was like, yes, when can I come to Belgrade? There's a Belgrade office, I wanna come. So I'm pretty excited to be here and I'm really happy you all are here too. So a little bit about my background. One of the things I like doing a lot is building collaborative projects that are interactive art. And I typically work in, I, I come from an industrial engineering background where I typically work with mechanical engineers and software engineers together. When I'm working on a new art project, which they're typically really large in scale, I try to work with a mechanical person, which oftentimes is my husband, Oliver Tanner. He's a mechanical fabricator. And you'll see me online a lot of times begging in forums for help writing software. So I'm not gonna talk much about what I did last year, but I'll just show a couple of the types of projects that I did last year. Around this time last year, I completed a project called Breathe. Breathe is 25 balloons and they are to represent pixels. When the balloon is deflated, it's off, and when they're inflated, they're on. This project is a two foot by two foot uh, box that's about eight inches wide, and the vision was to have a bunch of these boxes on a wall that would inflate and deflate as you walked by, perhaps powered by a Kinect or some kind of camera. So there are 50 solenoids crammed into this box with a whole bunch of hoses. And the reason for that was that the inflate and deflate rate on one solenoid turned out to be really different. So we had to source much bigger solenoids for a deflate rate with a larger aperture. So you can imagine how much of a pain in the ass this was cramming all of that stuff into a two foot by two foot box. Second project that I worked on last year, I started in about March, and there were nine people all together that worked on it. It was called Loquacious and Lovely. There are two unicorns, they weigh about 400 pounds each. 
and they're made up of welded steel, CNC cut wood, and laser cut wood, and we did some of it on a water jet. The bases, which are cut with a water jet, weigh 250 pounds each. And they're custom, I don't do much work with LEDs at all, and these LEDs were taken from another project called Dome Star, which is a bunch of my friends in New York, and they needed to cannibalize Dome Star because Dome Star was so popular, it had been all around the world, and they wanted to make a new version of it. So I inherited about a quarter kilo of uh, LEDs and like four controllers, which was pretty amazing. So we just changed the controllers a little bit to take a different voltage and work on batteries and put a battery uh, stop circuit in it. So really what I want to talk about is two of the projects I'm working on currently. And I'm, you know, when you're working on a project and it's in progress, it's, it's a pretty favorite part for me because the project started. So hopefully there's some kind of a plan and it's not finished. So you can't really look back and be like, oh, that project sucked. So first project that I'm working on has to do with polarizer film. And I think, I don't know how many of you have seen this demonstration before. It's like something from a high school physics class. Polarizer is plastic film that has some kind of uh, material that is uh, scraped onto it. When it is two pieces are held in parallel, light gets through. That's kind of like a selfie that I took holding these two pieces of film. When they are at 45 degrees, half the light gets through, and at 90 degrees, none of the light gets through. So somewhere between zero degrees, as in parallel, and 90 degrees, as in uh, at right angles to each other, you have some variation of light getting through in intensity. And on the bottom, that's uh, just a diagram I swap, I grabbed from a physics website, and it shows ambient light, like what we have here in this room, and everywhere, it's unpolarized, it flies everywhere, it has a direction. You can picture it kind of like a big circle. And once it goes through a polarizer, its main direction is in the direction of the polarizer. So you've all seen polarizer on sunglasses, and I'm showing here a glare on a window where I'm rotating a piece of polarizer film and you can see the glare disappearing and coming back. And that's probably the easiest way to explain how a pair of sunglasses works. So this was going around on an email chain at Hackaday last week, and I thought it really had a lot of relation to the projects I'm working on. So we see this 90 degrees and the light is blocked. So this GIF spawned a, an email chain of, I don't know, nine or 10 emails of how does this work? It, it's really like not what we expect to see, right? We have two pieces of polarizer that are at 90 degrees, no light is getting through. And then you stick one in the middle at 45 degrees and some of the light gets through. So this is exactly what I showed before. This is how it works. You have somewhere in between zero and 90 degrees, some amount of light intensity will get through. And it can be explained, of course, by math, which is a little bit beyond anything I can explain, but it's called Malice Law, and you can look it up if you're really interested to know exactly how much light is getting through. But in the previous thing, if it's exactly 45 degrees, it's about uh, a quarter of the light intensity. The polarizer project that I'm loosely working on will be exhibited in Toronto next week. Um, it's called 288, and it's 288 pieces of polarizer film that are mounted on 288 servo motors. And if you've ever heard a small servo motor, a hobby servo motor, you can imagine how cool 288 of these things sound all together. I feel like I'm gonna make a sound installation out of this. And this is, I was there last week uh, helping to work on it. I didn't really do much, just uh, spec some power supplies. But that's what they looked like in the box, two, uh, 400 servos, because some of them don't work, of course. And this is us working on the project in the Toronto studio. So the second project that I've just started working on has to do with liquid crystals. And I think we all know liquid crystals because they're in our phones, they're in our meters, they're I mean, on, your, on our computers, they're everywhere. Looking around online, you know, as you do, I came across this GIF in about 2011. And it's from a company called, uh, you know, very original name, called Liquid Crystal Technologies. And they're located in Ohio, in the middle or mid to east United States. And it's a small company. It's made up of an engineer, a scientist, and a salesperson. And the only person that I'm allowed to speak to there is the salesperson. 
And the salesperson tells me that their engineers are mean and crabby and we don't let them talk to customers. <laughs> so that's actually a bit of a problem because, oh, actually I also wanna say liquid crystal, I mean the, that exact uh, type of liquid crystal is also available in something called smart glass. And smart glass runs at 120 to 240 volts AC and it's used, it's called privacy glass or smart glass and this is a building that I admire tremendously. It's by Sir Norman Foster and it's in London. And the idea behind this building when they architected it in 2004 was to have a lot of conference rooms that were, could be turned on and turned off for privacy. So again, with this salesperson, uh, just to come back to that story, I call them up and I'm like, I wanna have some of that. They tell me it runs at under 20 volts, which is great. I don't like hacking on 120 or 240 and you guys shouldn't either. Um, so they sent me this when I asked for a sample. Um, two pieces of polarizer and a sandwich, a piece of glass, two pieces of glass with some smushy stuff in the middle. No wires, no documentation, like nothing. So, you know, this is, I'm starting to think that this company is really not taking me seriously because I keep calling and I'm like, I want to know more about how this works, like what exact voltage work does it work on, temperature range, all of these things, and they're just not giving me that information. So I'm like, can you just send me something that's assembled? And I'm thinking maybe I can just reverse engineer it. So just to say how these things go together, it's two pieces of polarizer on either side of the glass and it's kind of a sandwich, excuse my very bad CAD work here. And in the middle is the smushy stuff, the liquid crystal, which has, um, it's got like the viscosity of toothpaste or some kind of a gel. This is what they sent me when I asked for something assembled, which I think is pretty neat. I drew a smiley face behind it for this presentation. It's being run by an Arduino. There's a, the black lead is attached to ground and the red lead is attached to a PWM pin on an Arduino. And I'm just running, like I said, I'm not, I don't write software at all, so I'm just running an example. Something like analog write 255 to zero and blinking back and forth. But I think this, this was really inspiring to me, just to see this thing work. But you know, we've all seen this too. Um, Mike Stish said before he has all these old cell phones. I'm sure some of them have dead displays. I am also a fan of keeping all of my old electronics. Many of them have dead displays. And you can tell, you know, when your LCD is dying because you get black spots, you get discoloration, your letters are fading, or like this very extreme example that I found somewhere. And this has a really lot of discoloration. So, you know, LCDs can die because the, the power system goes bad or the controller chip goes bad. But I was really more specifically interested in what makes the LCD go bad itself. So, just as an aside, while I was researching this, um, a whole new industry has popped up and it's called replacing cell phone screens. So if you look at broken cell phone screens, you'll find, I don't know, 15 to 20 types of equipment ranging from this hand, uh, this hand one to ones that are industrial sized. And they're all dedicated to repairing iPhone screens. I, I mean, I just can't even imagine that there's a whole industry in repairing phone screens, but there is. Characterizing this LCD screen, I knew that the three most important things were temperature, drive signal, and power level. And temperature is a function of the liquid crystal medium itself that's in between the glass. Um, just by, by a function of what it is, it definitely has to be between zero and 50 degrees C. If it's too cold, like if I leave my meter in the car, it takes forever for it to turn on. And I'm sure many of you have experienced that with things that you leave in the car if you're in a cold part of the, the world. If it gets too hot, it gets a little bit runny around the edges. So of course manufacturers make things at a wider temperature range, but zero to 50 is something that's uh, a given. You, it will always be there. The power level, the salesperson really also wouldn't tell me that. You know, he's like somewhere in between five and 20 volts. I mean, really super unhelpful. The drive signal, 
as I showed the thing that I was running before with ground and an Arduino pin, you know, that's not going to work. If you give an LCD any kind of DC whatsoever, you'll kill it and you'll get that discoloration. So I set out to figure out what all these things were with my LCD screen. Uh, the temperature thing, I just put it in the oven and I saw it get runny and it was fine. So we'll just like skip over the temperature thing. Uh, again, from sort of high school physics class, just how these things actually work. Uh, liquid crystal comes in a twisted form and light gets through all the time. The polarizer is, it's only there as an, like it helps with the opacity. So you'll always see polarizer on a liquid crystal display and that's really just so that there's more dark. When you put power on the liquid crystal medium, it untwists, gets a direction and blocks the light. So I went down a mega serious rabbit hole on this. Um, physics and chemistry are not really my background, but I really wanted to understand the liquid crystal medium itself and how does DC power kill it. And you'll find that all over the internet. DC power kills it, but, like, but why? So Reddit, I found one thing on Reddit and the explanation given was that at AC, the liquid crystal medium bounces around, it oscillates a lot. And under DC, it goes to one side of the glass and stays there, causing this discoloration. But to get further into it, actually what is inside of a liquid crystal is a, um, like a rosin, a rosin columns kind of sheet that's put on there. And it's made out of a semiconductor process called photolithography. So these things are made out of ITO or indium tin oxide. And I, indium tin oxide is clear when it starts out, but under DC power, it will discolor. So that was pretty much good enough for me. That's like basic chemistry uh, explanation. And then just to show how uh, to bring it into uh, the real world, how a seven segment display works. I think that's the most common thing that we all work with LCD wise. Um, I showed before how when you put power on an LCD, it gets opaque. And for a seven segment display, the uh, indium tin oxide electrodes are laid out in this kind of a pattern. So you put power on it and you will get some form of number that's uh, decided by the controller. I wanted to also figure out how to fade these things. They're mostly shown in on off configurations. Like um, I think the one of the things that's in is like uh, video goggles, 3D goggles, and they're on off all the time. And fading, of course, using like a fade sketch for an Arduino doesn't work because you have DC again into your signal. So I had to find another way. And um, <laughs> so yay for fading. And I mean, it might seem obvious, but it definitely wasn't obvious to me. To fade these things, you give it an analog voltage and the number turns out to be about 1.3 to 2.1, if I was going to get really exact about it. And these LCDs, um, they're all different, but mine, turn on, they turn on, get completely dark at about 4.3. So there's this really, really small window. And I was thinking about, I'm still thinking about making an art piece with hundreds of these. So putting a fading circuit on each one is a little, it's, it's a little bit daunting, honestly, to have like some kind of op amp circuit on every single one inch piece of glass. So this is just a little animation I made up to kind of think about how it would look to have hundreds of these to play Tetris on, I think that would be pretty neat, or to build a three dimensional sculpture. Um, I think that would also be pretty neat. Probably not going to do any fading. It's probably going to be on and off because I actually think that making them fade, unless you, if you don't do it really well, it looks like it's broken. So in closing, I, uh, thanks for being here again. Um, I love collaborating with other people, especially people who write software and do data stuff. So you can find me all the time on hackaday.io. I pretty much live there, as some people say, and I'm on Twitter. Thank you.